welcome again to another episode of Under the White Coat. My name is Dr. Say Darvish, cardiologist in Brampton, Ontario. This is our weekly series where we sit down with key opinion leaders and get to know the personal side of some of today's leading doctors. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Omid Salehian, cardiologist and echocardiographer at Hamilton Health Sciences. He's an associate professor of medicine at McMaster University and is a director of the Advanced Echocardiography Fellowship Program. He's also very active in postgraduate medical training. I'm proud to say he's one of my mentors. Omid, thank you for being with us today. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks, Saeed, for having me. So, Omid, maybe you can start off by telling our viewers a little bit about yourself. Um, I was a, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but um, <laughs> I, I emigrated to Canada back in 84. I uh, lived in a small town. Um, uh, and uh, did my undergrad and graduate work at Brock University. Um, and then after that, I um, went into medical school to in, in University of Toronto, graduated in 1997, um, did my internal medicine and cardiology residency training in McMaster. And that's where I really uh, kind of really liked the atmosphere of McMaster University, uh, what it provides, the a collegial environment and um, as, as a whole I thought it was a place that I would like to work at. After I did my residency training I did a couple of fellowships. did a fellowship in uh, adult congenital uh, cardiology uh, at the University of Toronto and a second fellowship in uh, echocardiography in uh, Ottawa Heart Institute. And then we came back um, to Hamilton and I've been on faculty since 2005. So that's almost that's a great story. How did you decide in your training that you were interested in adult congenital heart disease? And for some of the people who may not be familiar with that specialty, what exactly is that? So maybe I'll answer the second part first. Um, uh, adult congenital cardiology is basically taking care of uh, adult patients who have uh, diseases in their heart that are related to, uh, you know, birth. So they were born with holes in their heart or they had surgeries very young in childhood because of abnormal connections within their heart. And the, typically these uh, children are followed regularly by pediatric cardiology services. Um, and then once they become adults, um, they are um, to be followed by the, the equivalent in the adult world where people like me and others like me who have some training in this area who know what um, you know, to look for in the long-term sequelae of some of the disease processes these individuals have. Uh, the other end of it is also patients who may not have known they've had congenital heart disease, uh, who uh, are subsequently picked up uh, incidentally, and some of the congenital heart diseases are quote-unquote relatively mild, um, so they can certainly be uh, not manifest themselves till into adulthood, and the, those patients will certainly need follow-up and potential surgical or interventional care. Um, so that's kind of generally what an adult congenital cardiologist does. The way to get into that area would be you have to have cardiology training before, and then you do a fellowship, formal fellowship. In terms of why I was interested, uh, probably twofold. One is that, uh, you know, it's probably personal. Uh, personally, I was born with a congenital heart disease myself, not that I knew till I actually had to have surgery. Um, and that kind of kind of put something in my head that it, this is an important area, and I like to contribute to it and be involved in the care of these patients. And also, it's an it's an area that's quite different in ge that general cardiology. Not that general cardiology is not challenging, um, but but I think it provides another avenue for um, patients that have very unique. Um, you know, um, needs, uh, unique problems. Um, there's always problem solving seeing these patients. Um, and it requires a, a, a significant amount of collaboration with different teams. And uh, I mean, we hear about heart teams now in general cardiology, but congenital cardiology has always been heart team approach. Um, and, and that's one of the things I really enjoyed about it, you know, having to work with everyone uh, to uh, get better care to your patients. Yeah, remembering my time doing the rotations in adult congenital, it was uh, obviously very complex patients. You're dealing with patients, um, as you said, you're often interacting with the teams down in Toronto and other academic institutions. 
What is important for a general cardiologist to know about adult congenital in terms of when should they be referring a patient to an adult congenital heart specialist? That's a, a question we get asked quite often. Um, um, certainly, uh, I think a general cardiologist um, has all the tools necessary to take care of 99% of patients who show to their door. Um, there are a certain subset of patients with congenital heart disease um, that probably should not be seen by regular cardiologists as the sole provider of their care because they have very unique um, uh, you know, care needs and uh, potential for intervention. The windows may be closing very quickly. And if one is not aware of those windows um, you know, and is aware of what can be done for their problem, then the uh, opportunity to help them um, adequately may be missed. So generally what we say, more complex diseases definitely should be referred. So patients who've had cyanotic congenital heart disease uh, so they were blue at birth, but may have had surgical intervention. Patients with transposition of great arteries, tetralogy of fallot would be the two most common cyanotic congenital heart disease we would expect to be referred. Um, but in general, any congenital heart disease, it's reasonable to be referred at least for an initial consultation. So that way, they, a, a kind of something can be set forward as a plan for care of this individual that may involve only seeing the, um, the local cardiologist uh, in, you know, for the rest of the time, uh, but be available for um, potential issues that may arise as this individual ages. Um, so, so there is a huge variation in even simple congenital heart disease. Say, for example, atrial septal defect. You can have somebody who's completely asymptomatic or somebody who has severe pulmonary hypertension who has Eisenmenger syndrome. Those two, although they're the same disease, have completely different set of care requirements. And one is considered to be much more complex, um, obviously with the Eisenmenger syndrome, than the one who has just a small septal defect with really no other um, abnormality that requires uh, particular attention. That's great to know. And I think um, us cardiologists in the community are very fortunate to have yourselves and other um, specialists uh, uh, available to us for, for these very complex patients. You know, speaking of these complex patients, we're in, we're in a bit of unprecedented times. You know, um, we're in COVID-19. I get asked a lot about patients with cardiac conditions, as we know that cardiac conditions may, certain cardiac conditions may predispose individuals to you know, adverse morbidity from COVID-19. Do you get that a lot with your adult congenital patients currently? What are you advising the, uh, these types of patients? Yes, definitely. I think as uh, basically March of March, April, May, we had many phone calls from our patients or emails. Um, remember this agent, uh, this patient population, especially the ones who've had surgical intervention in childhood, um, have been to doctors all of their lives. They're uh, used to being told that they have lots of problems with their heart and with their body, and, and they're always worried and anxious in general. Uh, about what's coming and, you know, how to put, best protect themselves. Um, so what generally we say, the ones who have complex diseases, especially those who have pulmonary hypertension, um, I think those are the ones that have, would be at a higher risk. Cyanotic patients, obviously, would be at higher risk. I think the simple defects, the individuals who may have an atrial septal defect or a restrictive ventricle septal defect who have no other lung issues or immunologic uh, dis diseases otherwise that are not obviously related to the congenital heart disease uh, would not necessarily be at a higher risk uh, than an average individual. Uh, we still guide them that they should follow all of the public health guidelines um, and be careful and uh, uh, be smart in what they do or how they interact, um, irrespective of their underlying heart condition. Uh, but the ones that are more obviously significant disease are the ones we kind of really want them to minimize their exposure, um, see, seek medical attention, even for minor symptoms, uh, be tested early, um, and, and follow guidance based on the testing results. In terms of seeing them in clinic, I think obviously, as you know, just like anything else, uh, we have had to limit um, patient exposure to hospital environment and clinic environment during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've um, tried to uh, have more phone conversations and phone consultations to see, pick up those patients who may be trending towards uh, problems and seeing those uh, when needed. Um, thankfully, we haven't had that many, but certainly there have been a couple of patients who ended up in the hospital 
uh, in my practice during COVID-19, not with COVID, but with, uh, you know, worsening cardiac condition, um, which certainly, um, um, you know, there's a whole element of people trying to avoid hospitals in general. And because of that, I think we're seeing across cardiology, and I'm sure it's true for other uh, specialties, we are seeing patients waiting not seeking medical attention and coming in, in much worse shape um, than they would have otherwise. Um, and sometimes uh, it's too far gone. Uh, if somebody with an MI who's waited a week and a half to come to the hospital now becomes a mechanical complication um, is obviously a completely different entity than somebody with an acute STEMI who you hopefully can help much uh, in a more timely fashion. I think you've touched on a very a number of important points there. We we do I think public health uh, officials are aware of this kind of COVID death gap that is occurring, and we're seeing people who are you know their mortality rates are up, but it's not necessarily due to COVID. And you know we're left to wonder, as you said, is it because people are delaying their presentation to a hospital or delaying visiting healthcare providers? We um, the other aspect, and you've mentioned it, is that virtual care and phone calls have really picked up uh, during this time. It's, it's probably seeing its moments right now, for better or for worse, for some in some patients. You, you deal with a very complex patient population. Um, what's your views on virtual care uh, during this time? If I can ask. <laughs> I know we're talking think, to each other virtually right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think it has some merit. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we'll fool anyone seeing that it replaces direct patient care. Um, I, I think obviously the more complex your patient is, the more, the less you get out of that virtual care. Um, you know, the, I think the individual on the end of the phone as well, the physician taking the history is also, I think experience changes um, how good that virtual visit goes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think we all learning how to be better historians or taking a history, um, um, you know, and, and picking up on subtle hints on history that would be helpful. Um, I think with these patients, obviously, it's even more challenging because um, a lot of what we do is their physical examination to guide us. You have virtually no physical examination when you obviously do virtual care. I think you can have OTN where you can actually see the patient. I think that will not help you, obviously, with some of the other additional stuff, but it's a, um, it's a potential uh, help. Um, I, th- I think um, my, I have a bias, and I, I, I think it, it serves a purpose in the short term, but I think we are just delaying the, um, the problems by seeing patients virtually and just delaying and deferring a lot of the care uh, down the line because they sound good over the phone and we like to not make a huge changes over the phone before seeing them. Um, so it does, um, I think, delay some of the um, potential changes in the care of these individuals till they're seen the next time. Um, and, and I think physical examination is a big part of what we do in cardiology, especially in congenital cardiology. And, Um, Right now, there's no way to do, you have to rely on a home blood pressure monitor um, who the individual um, may or may not have used, uh, may or may not be accurate. Um, And, uh, you know, home oxygen saturation monitor. I think that's the extent of of our physical examination now. Um, And, uh, um, you know, it's it's somewhat, obviously, uh, you feel empty coming out of that conversation often, uh, at least I do. Um, not knowing very well if I have confidence in uh, what I've decided to do with that patient. For that reason, we see them more often. So we try to uh, decrease the frequency of their visits, um, um, sorry, increase that rather, to, to, to virtually see them more often, um, as opposed to if I've seen them in person, I would have seen them um, you know, every six months. Now I've seen them every two, two months, for example, or talk to them every two months to make sure that we keep on top of things. I think that's a very interesting and unique uh, perspective. It's important for clinicians to know that while there are these very, there are some very real benefits to virtual care for both patients, you know, their convenience factor, I think, plays in. And obviously, some patients don't want to visit hospitals convenient, but there is these drawbacks, as, as you said, as the patient becomes more increasingly complex, I think virtual care has its limitations. You're actively involved in uh, medical education and training. And, you know, even during my time in training, med- virtual care and these virtual tools were not something that was really taught or the, how 
Do you think this is going to impact, you know, and as the physical examination has become less and less emphasized, um, for better or for worse, again, uh, probably for worse, I, I, <laughs> to be honest, how, how do you think these things are going to impact medical education, the next generation of learners that are coming out, the, coming out of the medical schools and residencies? Yeah. I think that's a very complex question. Uh, I, I think um, there is certainly some merit and benefit um, on virtual care that, uh, and, and helps us be efficient. And it may help develop technologies um, to help um, narrow the gap you know, by providing some um, you know, physical exam tools that the patient can have in their home and they can use just before you see them and the data can be sent to you. Uh, in the, either in real time or otherwise, and there are many companies who are kind of looking into these um, tools to help. Uh, and without COVID, I don't think we'd have that uh, kind of drive to help with these scenarios. Um, I, I think we have been in the last probably two to three years in, in a kind of a divergence in medical education in terms of physical exam, as uh, there is more and more um, you know, um, easy diagnostic handheld tools become available. Um, I think we are relying on those a lot more uh, as uh, attending physicians and hence by, um, you know, the same, fo- uh, same way our, our trainees are relying on them a lot more. Uh, and then the physical examination is, is slowly losing, um, you know, um, its traction. You know, it's or its importance in the eye of trainees. Um, you know, and I, um, I remember I used to give rounds, I still do, like to PGY ones and twos about valvular heart disease. And um, you know, you go through physical examination and somebody's got aortic stenosis. Um, trying to help people understand there's some um, aspects of physical examination that can tell you how severe the aortic stenosis is fairly accurately. Um, and I remember two or three years ago, a PGY one asked me, um, why do we need to know all of this? I'm going to get an echo on this patient anyway. Um, you know, and, and I think that obviously made me a little upset at first, but yeah. I see the point. It, you know, what our, our um, world has become a little bit perhaps more automated, uh, relying on diagnostics, a much more of a... Um, um, kind of shoot first, ask questions later um, approach because it's more efficient. Um, we are constantly seeing much more complex patients who have many comorbidities. And I think uh, diagnostic tests of all kinds have become much more um, um, used as tools to help us sort out the complexity better. Um, and, and I think the physical exam, the reliance on physical exam has completely gone uh, out because uh, um, of some of these factors. A second hand to that is that we also as faculty don't do as good a job to emphasize the importance of physical examination in our clinical encounters when we have trainees uh, with us. Um, you know, um, you've been with us, you know that you come to clinic, you see a patient and you can, um, you know, sort out by physical examination how severe the stenosis is or how severe the mitral regurgitation is. Um, and you don't necessarily need to have had the three tests before you see the patient to sort that out. Um, and we can potentially be better um, in providing care by using less uh, tests and potentially less cost to medical system by being better at physical examination. Uh, however, it is, uh, I think it's a sign of times. I don't think we can go back, uh, you know, and teach, uh, you know, to people who don't want to be taught, um, you know, things that I, I think we can emphasize and put it in a new context. So how is, for example, in my world, um, you know, correlates of focus finding with physical exam finding, help people understand what they see on their, um, you know, point of care ultrasound, how it compares with what they hear or listen. And, and still in, its, in a little way, trying to emphasize the importance of physical exam. Um, you may be practicing places where you may not have easy access to things uh, when you end up practicing. Um, and, and having something that you can rely on that is always with you, uh, that's your stethoscope, and I guess what's between your ears uh, would be really helpful <laughs> uh, you know, to, to delineate or figure out exactly how uh, to proceed and don't be lost because you don't have tests. 
this is what I worry about is, yeah. is we are training a generation of uh, trainees and I'm not, I'm, I'm maybe generalizing, um, um, you know, who are very reliant on uh, diagnostics and don't have confidence in their own, their own physical exam abilities or diagnostic abilities without the test. Yeah, I think I think those are excellent points, and I share a lot of those sentiments. You know, the there is, as you said, there's probably no going back. We're never going to go into an age where diagnostic tools like and and the echo and even these advanced you know machine learning AI is going, it's going to happen it, it, unless you're a luddite and you don't want to embrace yeah. technology. But at the on the on the other hand of it, I think there are aspects of the physical examination that a lot of trainees or a lot of physicians often forget the therapeutic relationship with the patient. Even you know the, the you know, patients do still like getting examined, physically, uh, having a physical examination on top of what it is. And as you said, it, it does, um, it also helps to expedite what tests you may want to order. And as you think, as, as we are entering a, a world of increasing fiscal restraint, you know, uh, what, who knows what the healthcare budgets are going to be like. I think choosing the right diagnostic tools uh, effectively is also going to be important. I still think the histophysical examination plays a role. The other worry I have is that this stuff starts to creep into the history taking too. I don't know if you share that sentiment is that as diagnostic tools become more and more prevalent and easy to use the point of care, I think, you know, first is the physical exam to go and then, you know, the history starts to heart history starts to fade as well. So I think I share the same sentiments you're saying what, um, I'll ask you maybe a few more questions just to end off, but where do you see the next five years in cardiology? Where do you think, where do you think the field is going? Um, uh, taking back to some of the stuff we talked about today. Yeah, I think, I think it'll be, um, a huge portion of AI. I think that's going to be big in cardiology. A lot of what we do in diagnostics relies still on physician interpretation and knowledge, um, um, which is, you know, highly variable. Um, you know, it's pattern recognition at the end of the day for whatever we do be it ECGs, echoes, MRIs, CAT scans. Um, and why can't a machine do that better, theoretically? There have been many models developed that actually in diagnostic imaging world have been just as good or almost better, you know, than physician interpretation in a much more timelier fashion. So I see that being, I think, an area where um, you will have more AI. I think it requires, though, a a good involvement on good clinicians to make sure um, it is done the right way. And, um, you know, uh, it doesn't replace completely a diagnostician's, um, you know, abilities. Uh, but I see that being a huge component from the development of tools to help become more efficient is the AI. And, and I think probably in the next five to 10 years, echo interpretations mostly will be done by AI. Uh, with the physician just signing off and when they have reviewed the images quickly to make sure there's no major errors. Um, and, you know, I think certainly uh, we may be hitting the, some of the, um, um, you know, the peak of our, um, uh, you know, tools in terms of medical treatment of some of the, you know, med conditions in general cardiology, ischemic heart disease, heart failure. I think there's every trial that comes out, there is less and less incremental benefit. Um, so we may be hitting the, uh, the real amount of benefit we can gain uh, by adding another medication to it. Um, um, but I don't think that's going to stop people developing medication. But, uh, but I think it's going to um, potentially um, make the care a little bit more complex because we'll have many, many more choices of things that are very similar in terms of how much um, they can provide. Uh, in a, somebody who may have heart failure yeah. and, and uh, we have to have a very good handle on the trials um, and decide if our patient fits that, you know, patient population that we're used to make sure we pick the right patient uh, and the right, right treatment for that patient. Um, I think those are the two areas. I, I think certainly AI and development of more and more powerful, um, you know, computers going to help um, us hopefully be, be better and more efficient physicians. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it doesn't turn us into some automated monkeys. You and I could be sitting on the side and just signing off on reports, but I think those are that's the, <laughs> Yeah, that's the worry, right? Because they have certainly been, I think, uh, on the internet, they have been, right? There are um, WebMD, a few other ones have put these kind of uh, questionnaires you fill out and it tells you what's your disease, um, it, you know, and, and it's 
it, I'm not sure again how maybe accurate relatively, but it takes away all of the other things that come from that therapeutic relationship, you know, with a physician, which is quite important. Absolutely. I think uh, both those points are very valid. Well, I'll, I'll end off. Um, it's the NBA playoffs. I know you're a big, you're a big basketball <laughs> fan. Who do you have going through? Uh, what do you think of the Raptors and their chances of repeating? Um, I think the Raptors uh, have a good chance coming out of East. Uh, they've been, uh, uh, I think Milwaukee hasn't really paled, played as well in the bubble as, um, you know, they did it during the regular season. I think they're sputtering a little bit. Um, I think the, uh, Boston um, is injured. Uh, so is Philadelphia. Those were the other two probably good teams. Miami scares me. I think Miami is a very good team. Um, they play defense and they, they can surprise people. Right. And, you know, uh, but I think Toronto has a probably one in three chance coming out of the East. And uh, that's what I would say, although I certainly want them to come out of the East, but it may be a challenge. I think the West is much more of a wild card. Yeah. I think any team can beat any team any night. Lakers are not going to get out of the West. I think they're way too... Really? You think so? Yeah. Well, I think they have a tough uh, first round draw too. <laughs> they, they, they do. And they also have very... Like they haven't really played well. You have, uh, they have key pieces of their team missing. Um, you know, the guard play is going to be deficient to some extent. LeBron can only do so much, I think. Uh, so I, I don't see them coming out. Uh, Clippers... Um, are a very good team and they're getting more pieces back theoretically, but they also have some injuries. Um, I think they have a tough matchup with um, Dallas right now. And that's a great series. I think if you like offense and um, you know, that's a great series to watch. Um, Yeah. So I really, I think West is a lot more question mark for me. I think the Clippers probably still end up coming out of that West, but I, I, I think any team can come out of the West. Yeah. Um, so I really can't tell. How about you? Who do you who do you got? I uh, I, I think Raptors Bucks is probably going to be the Eastern Conference Final, and yeah. I have to go with the Raptors being the hometown. Uh, I hope that they can pull it together. I think Nick Nurse has done a great job, and I think all yeah. of us want to see Raptors Clippers and Raptors beating beating Kawhi. Yeah, Kawhi, so, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that's probably where I'm hoping it goes. Yeah. One final yeah. question: <laughs> Yes or no? Is LeBron the goat? No. <laughs> no, I think for for anyone who's who lived through Michael Jordan era, who watched him play, who was my favorite player of all time, uh, I, I can never say LeBron is the GOAT. I think LeBron is an excellent player, probably maybe two uh, or three, depending on how much you like uh, Magic Johnson. Um, you, you know, I, I think you uh, he's uh, having not won championships when he's had opportunities to do so is going to go against him. Um, he's, uh, you know, uh, where, you know, Jordan was six for six. Yeah. And, in, you know, uh, I think um, and most you know, of us know that if he was around the years he went for baseball, he might have been eight for eight. That's right. Well, you can't argue with the chip and the rings. Um, LeBron, if you're listening, two of us don't think you're the GOAT. But, Omid, uh, I want to thank you once again for joining us today on Under the White Coat. It's great. And, you're welcome. Uh, I, really, I think our listeners are really going to appreciate your insights. Thank you so much.